Thank you. So let's go ahead. I have no disclosures. Oh, and there's a polling question. This will be really helpful. Does your program offer home sputum or home induced sputum options for patients? Let's see where we're at. So this is everyone's opportunity to answer this polling question. Yeah. If your program, whether your program offers uh, sputum induction uh, for patients, what's that? Second answer, yes. Third answer, no, not anymore. Fourth answer, no, never. Wow. And there, there you can see the results. 39% no, never. Uh, followed by yes, 33%. And a significant percentage, what's that? So we have a... <laughs> our work cut out for us. Go ahead, thank you. Is there any other feedback from the panel about that statistic? No, it looks like over uh, half the people said either, uh, what's that or no, have never offered it. So this will be a great uh, didactic. Yeah. I'm gonna... So go ahead. So I have no disclosures. The objectives today, what I'd really like to help uh, increase awareness of is the efficacy and yield of sputum induction compared to other sputum collection methods, identify the uh, necessary assessments prior to procedure, and really help uh, build some capacity for sputum coaching. That is such an, an integral uh, point that really can make all the difference for collecting quality specimens. And we'll touch on the infection control principles we need to follow in the home setting. And then I'll do a demonstration of setting up our home nebulizer in some of the post procedure. Go ahead. So I did a literature review looking for some of the efficacy standards as I've known all along. And it just to start out, I have to say, if you were to take the ability to do a home induced sputum out of my TB toolbox, I would be a very unhappy TB nurse. I feel like the induced sputums are my best tool in my toolbox, and I actually can't imagine doing my work without it. So, uh, and because it is so effective, it can get such quality results with minimal effort. And uh, when I train our new staff, it really comes down to everything you do in TB is based on the, on the quality of the diagnostics you've got to work with. So in the most recent 216 ATS IDSA combined CDC guidelines, they do list some of the, the efficacy and value of induced sputum. And it's just sort of buried in those guidelines, but it's a real gem and I wanted to point it out. So the question they're asking is, should sputum induction or flexible bronchoscopic sampling be the initial respiratory sampling method for adults suspected pulmonary TB or unable to expectorate sputum? And the evidence was they identified six studies, compared di diagnostic yield of induced sputum with the yield of sputums obtained by flexible bronchoscopy, and five of the six studies demonstrated higher yield from induced sputum than bronchoscopy, with the remaining studies showing a similar yield. And it's, it just goes on to point out that the diagnostic yield of induced sputum increases, of course, with the multiple specimens, with detection rate by AFD smear 91 to 98%, and by culture 99 to 100%. And as much as we tear ourselves out trying to know is it or isn't in TB issues, to have anything approach 99 to 100%, we've got to take the best, we, that's pretty impressive. And the bottom line is induced sputum has equal or greater diagnostic yield than bronchoscopic sampling, has fewer risks, and is less expensive. Go ahead. Oh my, this came out in a funny font. Um, what I wanted to point out was just when I was a newer TB nurse, I, I knew induction was helpful. I knew it had effectiveness, but I didn't understand the principle or how it really worked. 
And this was a helpful little uh, short explanation. And I'm sorry to read it word for word, but I believe your slides also came out really small print or on the printed copy. And it's a description from um, uh, excerpt tuberculosis and respiratory diseases uh, 2014. So how does induction increase sputum production? The water content in the airway originates from the blood flow surrounding the airway and diffuses into the lumen through the osmo through an osmotic pressure that is mainly determined by sodium and chloride ion concentration. Salt delivered by nebulization increases the osmotic pressure in the airways and draws more water into the lumen. As a consequence, mucins in the airway are diluted, facilitating sputum expectoration. In addition to its dilutional effects, hypertonic saline also has a protussive effect by stimulating cough reflex, which is believed to facilitate sputum expectoration. So that's the main principle of how induction works. And the key is using the hypertonic uh, saline. But then I got myself very uh, flustered by not being able to find the, the gold standard of what hypertonic concentration should be. And the, the CDC lists in their guidelines 3 to 5%. And yet we have trouble finding three to 5% and as a practical matter to order. We've tended to use 7%. And then I did a, a search of other uh, health departments. I found one health department in our state uses 10%. Um, but it helped me when I saw a quote from a British uh, publication saying there's no acknowledged ideal concentration or standard. Um, it varies 3 to 10 percent. That helped me understand why I wasn't seeing even different, different studies use different concentrations of the, the hypertonic saline. And it, their British facility uses 7 percent as a standard because it was readily available and caused less cancellations. And that's actually a thing. Um, I got a call last year from our own hospital. It was an infection preventionist. There was a rule out patient. The physician had looked up the CDC guideline. The physician had ordered induction by 3% hypertonic saline. And the facility said they couldn't order it. They couldn't find it. They didn't have it. So they were going to cancel the procedure. And it was like, what? I, I told them our uh, experience using 7%, we had not had issues that it had worked well for us and perhaps they could inform the hospitalist that the health department has had adequate su success using 7% and uh, that he could perhaps consider using a higher concentration. And I believe that's what they did. So are there any questions about that concentration issue? Maybe we can come back to that in a, in a minute. Uh, go ahead. So I pulled a procedure, procedural guidelines from National Jewish in Denver. These are there for their in-house staff for doing a sputum in-house. These are some of their, their guidelines. And I just wanted to highlight the main point they make is if there are patients who have pre-existing respiratory conditions, there should be consideration of doing a pre-procedure fast, using a pre-procedure bronchodilator. Um, for patients with asthma, COPD, emphysema, um, and patients using the long-acting control, the Advers, the Spirevis, may not need that extra boost of uh, fast-acting. Um, and, you know, I don't know if it's just uh, luck, if it's it just ha circumstantial, but I I can't say in my 10 years of doing induced sputums, I've ever had a problem of a patient going into a severe bronchospasm post-procedure. Um, so I feel uh, a little uncertain why that is, but I have not, in my experience, seen that. Um, but I still think it bears uh, good assessment bearing in mind. Um, the other point I wanted to bring up that National Jewish shows is the varying concentrations of saline. That 0.9% normal saline generally is not going to be effective. It will not 
help help to induce sputum in our experience. Um, they also list an approximate time frame, five to 20 minutes. In my experience, and that is one of the, the principles of the higher concentration of saline, if you think the, the physiologic principles of how it's working, you will have a greater effect in a shorter amount of time using the higher concentration. If you use lower concentration, it's just going to take longer. I don't think I've routinely very often nebulize somebody more than 20 minutes. In my experience, you are using 7%. I usually find people ready to cough at about seven to eight minutes. And that seems fairly reasonable, both as far as general tolerance and getting a good sample. Um, and it makes the point that induced sputums will be watery and thin. Most of the time, people think of sputum as being something gunky, yellowish, or green, or thick. And an induced sputum will be watery. It may be mistaken as only watery. Um, if you hold it up to the light, generally, you should see some um, more uh, globular uh, suspension uh, that can tell you there is some, some adequate actual sputum in there. Go ahead. So I had hoped to find maybe some kind of pre-procedure checklist of some sort. Maybe we can talk about developing that, but I did not find one. But I just kind of wrote down what in my own uh, experience and what my own standard is when I'm encountering, especially someone in the home who maybe is a rule out patient who has not been in the system yet, there's not a lot of data to read or records to review. If this is a fairly unknown patient, I want to take a good stock and assess the patient's general alertness, their breathing pattern, their pain level, their ability, their mobility, their ability to sit, stand, walk, and follow directions, and particularly make sure I have good language uh, capacity if it's a second language or a different language. And this all goes without saying, when I'm in the home, I'm wearing my N95 fit-tested respirator. Um, and I advise the patient before I go that I will be wearing a mask. To protect their privacy, I don't, gen and I'm sure most of my colleagues do this, we don't put the mask on in public view, but once I step in the home. Um, and I also try to assess if they have known respiratory conditions, whether they've been stable, have they had a recent exacerbation, what's, how, how have they been, do they have breathing, uh, inhalers, other respiratory medications, and if they've had not been successful collecting sputums on their own, that's generally why I'm asked to go. Um, I ask what they've tried, what were they told, what were their coaching, what coaching did they receive? And it's always helpful to have on hand just some stethoscope, a pulse ox, if those are needed. Go ahead. So different home environments, you know, you have to kind of take a quick lay of the land of what do you have to work with as far as the, the keeping infection control in mind, keeping the protection of other family members in mind, keeping the distance to a fresh air source in mind. So I try to take an overview of the home, the apartment, the setting where I am, and I prefer to find a ventilated room, meaning it has a window in that maybe is away from the main living areas of the home, if I can, an office, maybe a corner off a kitchen, a mudroom, a something that has proximity to outdoors, if it would, would be ideal. If it's possible to close that door off to the rest of the home while we're setting up or using the nebulizer, that's also ideal. And it, it took me a little bit of, of experience to learn that I don't have to set up and use the nebulizer in the same room I'm going to have the patient cough. That generally I would have the patient in a comfortable setting, a setting where there's a table or a coffee table, something I can set up the nebulizer. And then once they're ready to cough, they can just walk a short distance to an open air source, either out a door, out a sliding door, or um, some of the other possible places. If there's no yard, do they have a porch? Is there a balcony? Is there, and if there isn't any of that fresh air, 
Is there a garage that can be used to cough? Sometimes if I've had someone very frail, elderly, they can't walk far, or it's just an apartment without a opportunity to go outside, no balcony, Sometimes we've just had to open the largest window in the, in the home or in the apartment. And if I can establish a, a pull through breeze, that's ideal to try to get something to pull through um, and have them stand by an open door or window to cough. Um, and if none of that is available, the next uh, option is a bathroom with a fan. Obviously close the door, turn on the fan, have them cough and then uh, leave the fan on several minutes or 15, 20 minutes after procedure. Uh, and I usually also try to find a chair, hunting around for some kind of easy to move chair to have available wherever I'm going to have patients cough in case they become dizzy. Um, just don't want anyone uh, falling. I've had to get creative and come up with some alternate spaces I think some of you have heard the story where we had a student who came to us already smear negative, but I needed to collect sputums to document culture conversion at, before two months of therapy. He had no symptoms, no cough. His roommate, it was confidential, his roommate did not know he was on TB treatment. And uh, we did not want to do the sputum in his apartment. And the, we don't have a negative pressure in our health department. So what I did is I picked him up in the county car, brought him to the health department, parked in the back. We have a back door. I had a long extension cord. We plugged in the nebulizer with the extension cord, ran it out the back door of the health department, had the nebulizer in the car, set him up, doors open. It's a private alley in the back. Doors open, had him nebulized in the car, got her done, did it. Um, so I wouldn't say that's ideal, but it was a way to do an induced sputum um, safely and got it done. I've also used more recently the warehouse delivery bay of a private medical office. For just luck, I think that office happened to have a door to a large, huge warehousey area with one of those uh, uh, horizontal doors that we could open after the procedure. A large garage type doors so I just nebulized her in the back no patient used that area and staff were not to go in there for an hour afterwards um, with the door open so it's just a matter of, of keeping the infection control principles in mind keeping the patient comfort privacy principles and your own protection in mind doing an alternate site other than home induction go ahead so I know this slide also is a little busy, but I can't emphasize enough the, the points about coaching. Where I have found the failure of collecting adequate sputum, it's most often failure of adequate coaching. It just can't be emphasized enough. We have a newer patient. She was hospitalized 11 days was not able to do a spontaneous sputum while she was in the hospital. They did end up doing bronchoscopy. She was culture positive, not AFB positive, and we didn't get her results until a month after discharge. And when I went to her home needing to do two more sputum, she was convinced she couldn't do it. She said, I tried and tried in the hospital, and she just, even in the hospital, despite RT and uh, nursing, did not get adequate coaching. So I never assume coaching has been adequate. Some of the key principles, of course, is that we want to tell people we can't use saliva from the mouth. They've got to cough up from the lungs. Um, the best time to collect sputum is first morning on arising that the secretions do pool in the upper airways. Overnight, there's, it's like a low-hanging fruit. It's there, we just gotta get it up. Um, you know, the, when gravity takes over the rest of the day, those secretions have just farther to, to have to travel to get up and out. Um, generally, I don't have people uh, rinse before collecting 
Um, unless for some reason they've eaten in the last few hours or they ate during the night, then we would have them rinse before collecting. But I also emphasize that they, this is going to take major effort. This is not a little huh, huh, cough. It's got to be using your full abdominal muscles. You've got to put all your energy into it. You've got to cough so forcefully you're afraid you might throw up. I mean, I just emphasize, as I'm sure many of you do, the forcefulness that they're going to need to cough. Um, and again, it's, it's, you can exert more abdominal muscle strength by standing up. But it's not impossible to collect sitting down. I have plenty of folks who have to sit down and they do just fine, but they just need that encouragement. It's gotta, you gotta use your muscles, you gotta forcefully cough. Um, and you know, the patient, our current patient told me if she had been told that she could do it, that it was there, it was just a matter of getting it up, if she knew she was going to have to cough that forcefully, she felt she could have done it in the hospital, but she didn't get that information. Um, it's also helpful to help them quantify how much they need, showing just the bottom of the cylindrical tube is all you need. And I notice in the flat bottom specimen containers, that's harder for people to judge how much do you need in one of those. So it's helpful to say about the size of a quarter or maybe a large marble on the flat bottom type containers. And it's also important to say it's going to look watery with the induction. It's not what people think of this thick, gluey stuff that they have to cough up. That um, it's important to say it's going to look like water, but it's going to be good. It's going to be the real stuff. Don't think you failed if all you get up looks like water. And I had forgotten to say that recently, and the patient called and said they couldn't do it. And I went back and they had done it. They just didn't recognize that it was sputum. I had forgotten to say it's going to look clear. Um, a couple, if we're in a rush rule out mode, you know, I'm sure you know it's okay to collect two sputums. We use the CDC standard at least eight hours apart. And if they're going to keep one overnight, it needs to be refrigerated. The labs are pretty. Um, it seems odd to me that, you know, the labs, local commercial labs will reject if they hadn't been kept refrigerated, but we send ours off overnight to DOH and they're not refrigerated. <laughs> so, but uh, the, the worry is overgrowth with, uh, and I think we're entering more the season of where that might become more a problem. So let's go ahead. This is another teaching tool that I've found very useful over the, the last year or two. It's a YouTube video produced by uh, Madison Dane County Public Health out of Wisconsin. And it's amazingly helpful. It's only about seven minutes. It's in 19 languages. If you can see the languages, uh, it may be too small for you to read, but it, it's Vietnamese, Spanish, Russian, there's Chinese, there's uh, a lot of the East Asian languages. What I commonly do will uh, just, I'll, and this is on one of the handouts that I included on today's uh, session. Um, this YouTube, I will commonly just upload, just send a text to their phone with the link. And I created this originally for offices where many of the staff might not have a work-issued cell phone, so they couldn't just send it cell phone to cell phone. But there's a helpful little trick where you can send a video link from an email. So for instance, office staff in a, in a provider office can generally send an email from their own computer, but to send an email to a phone. So if for Verizon, if I wanted to send it to a patient with a Verizon phone, you just put the, their actual phone number in at vtex.com, and that will send the video to the patient's phone. And that's the easiest way just for them to watch this home collection video. It's just been a real helpful uh, link in the languages we tend to need. Go ahead. These are some just... Uh, Types of home nebulizers of the compressor type, uh, simple nebulizers that we use or can be ordered. Um, there is the ultrasonic nebulizer that we do not have. 
If you go to the conferences, they try to sell them. They're pricier. They do deliver a smaller micron size of particle that maybe Dr. Hahn or others can explain the advantages of the ultrasonic. We've had good luck just using this simpler air compressor type, um, but just wanted to show you various types. Go ahead. And I don't want to belabor this, but again, just review the question about risk of bronchospasm with the clinician prior to induction. If the saline concentration is a worry, if you only have 7% and a clinician would prefer to lower the concentration, it's just a matter of diluting uh, either with a sterile water or saline. You can get, a, I'm sure it's a simple, uh, algorithm to dilute it to a to a different concentration that you might want to use. Always be use protection for the the nurse N95 or PAPR. And uh, another point I didn't know where to put, but I stuck here is you certainly don't want a patient coughing outside in front of a fresh air intake, <laughs> and not to cough underneath an open window, perhaps of somebody else who's not been exposed. Um, I've also learned by the hard way of, that the sputums must be labeled induced, uh, both the requisition and the tube. I had a very sad experience of clearly labeling an induced sputum. You know, when you've traveled all that distance and you've done that sputum in the home, you feel like you've got gold to send in. And uh, I had only labeled the requisition as in induced sputum not the tube and the commercial lab discarded the tube because the osmolality is is assessed once it reaches the lab if it doesn't if it doesn't cut their osmolality uh, minimum threshold it's considered likely uh, saliva and labs will discard the samples um, so the moral of that story is you've got to label the tube as well as the requisition um, and so now we have little stickers we've created that we stick on the tube and the requisition to identify it as an induced sputum. And perhaps some of you have gotten a little qualifier or note from DOH public health lab that the specimen was watery. And that's because they do that, that uh, quality test at the beginning of their, their uh, assessment of the sample. So to avoid discarding, you've got to label it. And uh, you know, post-procedure, we do recommend uh, washing off at least the mouthpiece with some um, sterile or distilled water to keep that salt taste from building up and gagging people who may need to reuse the tubing to collect at least three samples. You can use a, a standard TB germicidal clean the nebulizer unit, cavi wipe, or a, a one to 10 bleach. We're getting toward the end. Thank you for hanging with me. I just wanted to give a demonstration of the, the supplies we use. Go ahead. So I'm gonna have to see if you, tell me if you can't see me. But we bring a nice green bag. Green is appropriate for sputum, don't you think? Bring a disposable green bag with our sputum supplies into the home. Oh, did I move this? I think I just, Sorry, I moved so I can't. Or bring them those. down. Oh, sorry. Would you like us to take the slides down, Anne, or keep them up? Uh, keep them up. Okay. Did they? I lost my view. There we go. Uh, can you still see me? All right. No, it looks like you stopped your video. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Anyway, we bring a disposable bag into the home. This bag we don't bring back, it stays, especially if I'm setting my common procedure. If I need three sputums, I try to go um, and set up the nebulizer, explain the procedure, uh, have collect the first sample while I'm in the home, then I'll leave the machine overnight, ask them to collect the next first morning, and depending on what time frame we have, either do two the next day or, pre, or do two 
on subsequent mornings and then pick up the nebulizer only at the end. But what we have inside the bag is uh, uh, the actual bag for the nebulizer unit. Our, user, our unit, can you see this? It's a little mini mate. It's plugged in the wall, so I can't bring it forward. But you can see it's very lightweight, very easy to manage, handle. We have a little, these are like you would get your, your drinks from a takeout place. We have a little holder where I've put three sputum bottles with the, uh, what we've learned is it's very hard to get patients to correctly label the tube itself. And we need the date and time of collection, so we have them collect it, just writing it on a bag, which has been helpful. And then this bag they would put in the fridge until ready to be collected. Um, and we have the saline to use for induction. These are little four millimeter uh, saline, seven percent saline tubes. No liter. I what? No liter. No sorry. Um, it, on top, it says use two per session. So we give Ziploc bags of the little saline, uh, you know, it's the twist off top. And I have tissues because when you're coughing that hard, generally you're going to need something to keep your hands in face clean. I have a one blue pad to set the supplies out on so I have a clean surface. Different homes, as we know, they may not have a nice clean surface. And the tubing set, and that's pretty much it. And setting up the tubing, boy, I'm not sure if you can see. Well, the webcam, I don't think, goes far enough down. But I've got the tubing to the compressor unit. I've got the little nebulizer unit. I've actually already opened up the two salines and included them in the chamber. This is a, a it only holds eight mils. Um, you can get larger chambers. It would mean it would sustain a larger or a longer time frame. And then the T tube goes on, oops, sorry. T tube goes on top. The exhale or the exhaust tube here. And then just the tubing to the unit. And they're nice and snug. And then this, I'm gonna have to set it down. There's, there's only one, the thing I like about these, they're, they're foolproof. There's one on off switch. There's one, one place to insert the, the tubing. And once you've got it going, uh, it just creates, I'm not sure what you can see. With the fine mist. So, we have patients just breathe, I have them breathe normally lips around the unit. If they need to take a, a breather or a rest, that's fine. Um, so I, it's tempting for people to want to breathe deep because they feel like they're doing a machine, but then they're more danger of hyperventilating. So I encourage people to take nice, slow, just deep, normal breaths, and uh, it usually goes very well. I've had, I've rarely had any trouble. Um, I think the next slide is just the references, so we can. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, or comments or other people's experiences. I, I, I guess I had meant uh, to describe a kind of funny, but at the time not funny experience of trying to collect and induce sputum. And one thing I wanted to point out is other family members, caregivers in the home environment should not help with the procedure if at all possible. Um, but there was an Afghani woman who had dementia. She was over, she was in her 80s, and we had had her in the hospital. She had a hepatotoxicity from PZA. We had had to let her liver cool down, and Dr. Stern wanted another sputum as we were resuming treatment. But it was so hard to get her to cough, and I had nebulized her in the home. 
we took her out on a porch and I actually had to have her son help demonstrate because she did not speak English. And there was me, a colleague and her son, we're all pretending we're coughing into a cup and she's giving us a blank look with her dementia. She had no idea what, we, what was wrong with us, what we were doing or what we wanted her to do. And we finally, we could not get her, despite all the gestures, we couldn't get her to cough in a cup. But I had to ask her son to help walk her up and down the, the porch with the walker. And just the, the act of walking made her cough. And so we were able to get it once she started walking. But normally I would not have a family member assist with the, the post-induction cough, post cough procedure.